A landmark Supreme Court ruling is a big win for Democrats, but maybe not for democracy. I'm Matt Robeson. This is Beyond Politics. We're available wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, on the Blue Amp channel on YouTube, joined as usual by my co-host, former Democratic U.S. Congressman Paul Hodes, overshadowed by the news of Donald Trump's indictment in the classified documents case last week, there was a major Supreme Court ruling that could tilt the balance of power in Washington. Our guest today says that, sure, that may be good news for the Democratic Party, but let's not start it throwing a party for democracy just yet. Steve Vladek holds the Charles Allen Wright Chair in Federal Courts at the University of Texas School of Law. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Shadow Docket, how the Supreme Court uses stealth rulings to amass power and undermine the Republic. And he's the co-host of the popular award-winning, and I have to say, very entertaining National Security Law Podcast. He's also CNN's Supreme Court analyst. And today he's our Supreme Court analyst. Steve, welcome to Beyond Politics. Thanks, Matt. Great to be with you. It's awesome to have you. I love these podcast crossover shows. And we do want to get into your book and the Supreme Court ruling. But I think as members of the media, we are contractually obligated to start with the indictment in the classified records case. Personally, my excitement over this is that I'm just looking forward to stamping my Trump frequent indictment card. My next stamp apparently gets me a MAGA hat, and I get to retile my bathroom with classified war plans. Uh, as a legal scholar, what stood out to you from the indictment? A lot. There, there's a lot of uncharted territory here, but I think the fact that there are 37 different counts against former President Trump alone, and that a majority of them are for violating the Espionage Act. It's really, it's mind-boggling that we're here, and yet I guess it's not mind-boggling that we're here. Some of the pictures in the indictment, I, I think everyone by now has seen the bathroom picture. Just the, the notion that there are all these folks now running around, falling over themselves to defend this behavior, I, I, I don't know. I At some point, we have to suspend disbelief and just say, guys, come on. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> Steve, I'm a former prosecutor. I was a prosecutor at the state level. Then I prosecuted white collar crime. And I have to say, people, some folks have said, gee, it's historic. This is the first president to be indicted by a federal. This, that's historic. What I actually think is historic is the level of criminality of Trump. And then, as you said, the second most historic thing is the nutso idea that members of the GOP, that the right and is try to defend him and actually use this to undermine democracy, which depends upon the rule of law as its bedrock. That to me is the most, seems to, is to me the most striking thing about this. And Paul, what I'd add is the folks who are defending Trump have to basically defend a fictionalized version of the indictment to do it. The, forget the pictures, the exchange between Trump and one of his staffers, where he says, this is secret. You have all these people falling over themselves on Twitter and elsewhere to say, he declassified everything. Here you have Trump on tape admitting that it was still classified. I just, there comes a point where I just have to shake my head because over the weekend, we've seen all of these self-appointed experts on the Presidential Records Act and the Espionage Act come out of the woodwork to say, oh, this isn't espionage, therefore it's not covered by the Espionage Act. Read the Espionage Act. Lots of things that aren't espionage are covered by the Espionage Act. Or my favorite, the Presidential Records Act immunizes him from any liability. No, the history of the Presidential Records Act is it was enacted in 1978 in response to Nixon, right? It's not a pro-president kind of statute. And so I just, I, I think there's, Folks are so in the tank for Trump at this point that they've just lost the ability to respond rationally to, Paul, what really is one of the more damning indictments in a national security case that I've seen, and I've seen a bunch. Yeah. I think what you're pointing to is something, Paul, you said in our immediate kind of post hoc reaction show last week, which is there's a big difference between prosecuting cases like this in the court of public opinion and prosecuting them in a court of law. And Steve, you attended the second best small liberal arts college in America. I went to Swarthmore. Yeah, I know. Sorry. And I, Amherst, I live in Amherst now, so I have to be careful here. And you're a professor. So you are very familiar with the student technique of, I just got a question I can't answer from my professor. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make up a question I can answer, and I'm going to knock that one out of the park. And it seems like what you're seeing on Fox News is a lot of that kind of behavior where it's like, we cannot answer 
for the legal implications here. So what we're going to do is erect a really close sounding straw man, right. and we're going to light that on fire. They're pretty good at that. But I think, Paul, what you were saying last week is the chickens come home to roost once you're actually in a court of law. You can't get away from what you actually have to defend here, which is the legal case, what the statute says, and what Trump did. And it seems, in the words of the Bard, very real and very full of proof. I don't see a way that he gets around the mountain of evidence here. Yeah, I think this is where we have to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the judge to whom this case has been assigned. I would say normally, yes, uh, he sure looks dead to rights based upon the indictment. The problem is that through a bizarre and I think just deeply unlucky spin of the wheel, right, the case was assigned to Judge Cannon, the same Trump appointed Florida district judge who threw such a wrench into the original investigation in this case and had to get slapped down by the Federal Court of Appeals, a panel that included two Trump appointees. I guess my concern at this point is not that the indictment is a close case. It's just not. My concern is that district judges have a lot of power to screw up criminal cases. And I'm a little worried about the fact that this case happened to end up before this particular judge. Can I hit you with a follow-up on that then? Because our previous guest, Joyce Vance, MSNBC legal analyst and former appellate chief in the 11th Circuit, had a little Twitter thread about this, and I'd like to get your reaction to it, because this is the number one point. I literally was in my backyard yesterday, and my neighbor stopped me, I'm probably listening to this right now, to say, I'm really worried about this Eileen Cannon thing. This seems to be dominating Twitter. So this is what Joyce had to say. Before everyone gets too spun up about reports, Judge Cannon has been assigned to the Trump case. A little law, I used to be the appellate chief in the 11th Circuit where Florida is, and I litigated a few appeals where we asked the Court of Appeals to order a judge to recuse. Although a judge's behavior in court generally doesn't form the basis for recusal. The 11th Circuit has ordered reassignment, that's in quotes, where a judge leans so heavily for a defendant, they call their objectivity in the eyes of the public into question. And then she quotes from U.S. versus Martin and says, this is a persuasive authority. The judge can and must step aside if the case falls to her as a permanent assignment. Her court, and certainly the 11th, won't tolerate the damage it would do to their credibility if she failed to voluntarily recuse. And she closes by saying, it is not clear Cannon is permanently assigned to the case. If she is, it's extremely unlikely it stays with her. And as a last resort, DOG will, will challenge her participation and win. Steve, what do you make of that? So we now know that she is the judge assigned to the full case. So it's down to, is DOJ going to challenge her and is DOJ going to win? And I want to say, I want I want to be as optimistic as Joyce is. Here's the problem. So the challenge goes to her initially. And if she really wants this case and wants to mess with it, she can say, I don't need to recuse. And then DOJ would go to the 11th Circuit, the Atlanta-based Federal Appeals Court. But the review that the Court of Appeals conducts at that point is highly deferential. And it is no given, even if you and I and Paul might think it should be, that the 11th Circuit would say she had to recuse. And then we get to the real problem, which is, in federal criminal law, there's a little switch called Rule 29 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, which allows the district court at the end, after a guilty verdict is returned by the jury, to enter a post-judgment verdict of acquittal. And that order is not appealable, which means that if she did, that would be the end of the case. And so I think like we ought to be stealing ourselves for the possibility that we go through all the motions of a trial that Trump has prosecuted, that he's convicted, and that a Trump-appointed judge lets him walk out the door. Oh, no I'm recourse. sorry. You've just blown my mind here. I feel like we buried the lead. Paul, this is you, you probably know about this as a former prosecutor. I'm not a legal person. Can I just read that back to you? What you're saying is that if a jury returns a guilty verdict in the classified documents case, Judge Cannon as the permanently assigned judge overseeing the case, can say, nope, can essentially do jury nullification here and come in and say, I am going to acquit you myself. And that is not appealable. There's nothing the Department of Justice can do about that. That's the way the, that's the, way the rule reads. It's a, it's a little bizarre twist in federal law that certainly is, I don't know of it in any state law. And it has not been frequently applied by judges because it's so extreme. It, the, the idea was to give judges the opportunity to do justice where, for whatever reason, the jury had 
had gone off the rails and was committing some horrible injustice, the judge would then be able to say, no, wait a second, I'm the judge. I heard all this evidence too. And we're just, we're going to, we need a do-over or whatever. We're, we're, this won't stand. And, and there's a way in which it makes sense, right? So if the government's case in chief, if the evidence the government has put on is insufficient as a matter of law, the jury, Paul, might still vote to convict, right? Out of apathy right. toward the, uh, sorry, apathy, as antipathy toward the defendant, right? Out of distaste for the, pro lots of reasons why a jury might convict in the face of legally insufficient evidence. The idea, Matt, is that the judge is supposed to be the arbiter of whether the evidence is legally insufficient. The problem is not the rule. The problem is it's unappealability. Like I, I actually think you can make a pretty good argument that it's helpful to have this kind of defendant protective rule in the system, but it shouldn't be absolute. It shouldn't be a sort of literally a get out of jail free card. Oh my gosh, you have blown my mind. And now you've got me, this is Alderaan has just blown up and a million voices suddenly cried out, what the hell is rule 29? We've just, we're going to overload Google here. Okay, at least we've given- On that uplifting note. Yes, right. Like we've given our democratic leaning audience what they crave most, which is something to worry about for the next two years. <laughs> but if this is why this is why I think there will be a lot of pressure on DOJ to try to ward off that possibility by moving to have Judge Cannon recuse and why I think that'll be where the fight is in the next six weeks to six months. That's and, oh, and, just, oh. and just to be particular so that our listeners and watchers can really steep themselves in the arcane, in the arcanity of this. The Rule 29 is titled Motion for a Judgment of Acquittal. And oh, uh, so within seven days after a, a guilty verdict or after the judge discharges the jury, whichever occurs later, the defendant can make a motion for judgment of acquittal. And our folks can only imagine how rarely, how infrequently that motion for judgment of acquittal is granted. And as you said, Matt, how not so in this case, the possibilities are of a Trump, of an in the bag for Trump judge granting the motion and it not being appealable. I'll give a final political comment and then we really should move on. But there has been a lot of bloviation on Fox News over the weekend. And we covered some of this in our recent video that went up Friday night. We called it MAGA Panic. You can find that on the Blue Amp channel about the idea, and we've heard this from MAGA types before, that we're turning into a banana republic and that somehow the prosecution of a former president and the leading nominee for the Republican nomination in 2024, somehow prosecuting a criminal for committing crimes turns us into a banana republic. I can only say that if Donald Trump were to be convicted and if this Rule 29 were to be invoked, if we went down this road and somehow Judge Cannon or someone else were to acquit him, were to vacate a jury finding that he is guilty, that would render us a banana republic. And I, Steve, I hear what you're saying. This rule is in place for good and sufficient reason, protects defendants. I am a justice system absolutist. But I am telling you, this is a prescription for democracy disaster. Speaking of democracy disaster, Steve, <laughs> you penned a really fascinating op-ed. I'm not trying to say that you're like a Debbie Downer of the legal system, but Democrats like me were- I had help with this one. Melissa Murray wrote it with me. Oh, yes. I do want to credit her in absentia. Like Democrats were happy and pleasantly surprised when we got this Supreme Court ruling last week upholding the applicability of the Voting Rights Act to this case in Alabama. And the upshot politically is it looks like Democrats are going to end up with three to seven more Democratic leaning U.S. House seats in the next election. That's great. And you came in and you say, OK, that is good. Hold your horses, but let's not throw a party yet. Why are you trying to bum us out, man? I think I bu bum out may not be maybe a little strong. I think I'm trying to make sure we keep things in perspective. Thursday's ruling in which the Supreme Court, by a five to four vote, agreed with two different lower courts that Alabama violated the Voting Rights Act when it redrew its congressional district maps after the 2020 census. Listen, that's a win. It's a win for the Voting Rights Act. It's the rare day in the Supreme Court when you get five votes to support the Voting Rights Act. 
And so I don't mean to tape all the air out of that balloon. The reason why Melissa and I wrote this piece for the Washington Post is to point out that we have been so beaten down and conditioned to think that anything short of a complete disaster in the Supreme Court is a win. And that if we actually put into perspective what really happened in the Alabama case, it actually looks pretty bad. Uh, just to back up for one second, the Alabama case first got to the Supreme Court last year in February 2022, when Alabama asked the justices for emergency relief. They asked the court to freeze these lower court injunctions that would have required Alabama to redraw its maps before the 2022 midterms. Alabama goes to the Supreme Court and says, hey, Supreme Court, you shouldn't make us. Like, we should be allowed to use our illegal maps in the 2022 midterms. And by a five to four vote with no explanation, the Supreme Court said, sure, go ahead. That ruling, Matt, if it had any justification at all, it was that there were five justices who actually thought the maps were in fact legal. Now it turns out there weren't, right? Now it turns out there were not five justices who thought that there were only four who thought they were legal, which means that the Supreme Court let Alabama use unlawful maps in the 2022 midterm cycle. Worse than that, right? The Supreme Court let Louisiana use unlawful maps in the 2022 midterm cycle. Those two rulings in the Alabama and Louisiana cases led directly to Georgia using an unlawful map in the 2022 midterm cycle and indirectly to unlawful maps in Ohio, South Carolina, and North Carolina. You add all that together, and as you say, you get to somewhere between three and seven seats that under these unlawful maps that discriminated against minority voters in those states were safe Republican seats. That I don't think it's that preposterous to think that had they been drawn to maximize the power of the minority voters in those states, would have been probably at least lean, if not safe, Democratic seats. And let's just remind folks of what the Republicans' current majority in the House is. It's five seats, right? You flip five seats in the House and the Democrats control the House. The Supreme Court flipped somewhere between three and seven. And for Melissa and me, it wasn't that like this was a bad ruling. It was that the ruling really was a galling repudiation of the Supreme Court's intervention last year, intervention that could have been directly responsible for why Republicans currently control the House of Representatives. Robeson, you and the rest of the whining lefties, really, you need to get your facts straight and your act together. You get guys like Steve Vladek out there as apologists for the Democrats. And really, all we're looking at here is the usual kind of decision making by the Supreme Court. They were simply deferential to the legitimate acts of these state legislators. They were, didn't want to intervene in the ongoing electoral process when it could have been seen as a political move on their part. They were protecting the integrity of the states. That's all they were doing. And they needed time to really consider what they were going to do. And so when it came up in the due course uh, here in 2023, they gave their consideration to it. Blah, 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 blah. This is a political Supreme Court acting politically. They wanted to protect the Republican majority. So it's a little bizarre that they even looked at it and came and finally ruled on this favorably in any way to Democrats. What it doesn't, wait a second, what it doesn't do, however, it doesn't do much given the previous rulings upholding political gerrymandering, upcoming ruling on the crazy independent state legislature theory where the the issue is going to be a, a can legislatures basically do whatever they want without judicial interference steve maybe you can help us understand this decision in the overall context yeah. of where we stand on legal and constitutional protections for fair voting and elections how bad is the situation even with this and yeah. is there any remedy so it's pretty bad. And it's bad. It's bad, not just because the court is saying one thing at the emergency application stage and something else on the merits. But Paul, I guess I would go a step further, which is, I think how important Thursday's ruling in the Alabama case was, will depend a heck of a lot on what the court does in the independent state legislature case, which is still to come. It's one of the 23 decisions that's still outstanding with a couple of weeks to go. And that's because let's just tie things together. So Partisan gerrymandering, which I think is the real sort of source of so many of our contemporary problems 
In 2019, a 5-4 majority, the conservatives, held that those challenges could not be brought in federal court. Okay, no problem. Take them to state court. The independent state legislature doctrine is an attempt to disempower state courts from reviewing partisan gerrymandering challenges. If it succeeds, I know there's all the folks who go all the way to the extreme version. If it succeeds, legislatures can throw elections to whoever they want. Maybe not. But if it succeeds even a little, it means state Supreme Courts are going to lose the power to review partisan gerrymandering under their state constitutions. And so right there, what we mean is that the very legislatures that have gerrymandered themselves to a fair thee well will get the last word on the legitimacy of the gerrymandering. This is a much bigger deal to me than the court finding, for once, a violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which is still important, but I think really pales in comparison to the damage that could be coming. Now, it's possible that the court is not going to go all the way in the North Carolina independent state, either because they're going to duck the case because the North Carolina Supreme Court has mucked around lately to try to make the case go away, or Paul, maybe they're going to narrow, adopt a narrow view of it. But I actually think for all the folks who are like, yay, our democracy is safe after Thursday's ruling, my reaction is give it a couple weeks. Wow, that's, wow, that's so depressing. You really, <laughs> Thanks, oh, Steve. Yeah. I, but hey, look, I, I do. I also think that you're providing a valuable service to us here, which is to take a clear eyed look at our problems really do run deep. And I will say on the as a programming note, for those who do want the political implications, just for the balance of power in the House and the way things will stand in Washington because of this ruling, two upcoming shows one is an interview that I've actually just done with my old friend, Michaeline Crowell, who was a, a legislative staffer. She worked for Ted Kennedy. She was Bernie Sanders' chief of staff. And crucially, she worked for John Lewis during the reauthorization of the 2006, the 2006 round of, of author, reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act and was hands in on that process. And she can provide and, and will, if you listen to that show, a lot of context on how we ended up with kind of the 2013 ruling from Justice Roberts that landed us at today. There's a lot of history here. And also next week, we are going to have John Bonsignano of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, who will be able to talk about all of the efforts, Steve, that you just threw out around the country, all of the gerrymandering, how the fight is going state by state across the 50 states. So if you're interested in that, and I think that there is some good news embedded in all of that, check out those upcoming shows. But I want to I want to turn back to something you said a moment ago, Steve, about the nature and the timing of the Supreme Court action to essentially let these unconstitutional illegal maps go forward. They issued this 5-4 ruling with no explanation. You didn't say explicitly that they're part of that ruling was part of the shadow docket. But I have a feeling that there's a connection here to your book, The Shadow yeah. Docket, which I think was a title that was in the running for a Jason Bourne film before you took it for your book. Congratulations. Oh. Yes, exactly. So can you tell us a little bit more about this? Because congratulations, it's a bestseller. It's a really compelling topic. What is The Shadow Docket? And why are we, why should we be so worried about it? Sure. So the shadow docket, it's this evocative shorthand that was not meant originally to be pejorative. It's a term that was coined in 2015 by a conservative Chicago law professor named Will Bode. And Matt, Will meant it really just to say, look, we spend all of our time fixated on the merits docket, on the 60 or 70 signed decisions the court hands down every year after multiple rounds of briefing and argument, like the Alabama redistricting case last Thursday. And Will's point, which I think is completely just irrefutable at this, you know, now, is that a lot of important stuff happens on the rest of the court's docket, that beyond these 60 to 70 merits decisions, the Supreme Court does a whole lot of significant stuff through orders that by tradition are unsigned and unexplained. Just volume-wise, Matt, it's more than 99% of the court's docket is unsigned, unexplained orders. Now, most of that is just denying appeals, right? Most of that is the Supreme Court turning away discretionary requests that the court take up an appeal from a lower court. But there's a subset of these that involve what's called emergency relief when early in a case, before the case has gotten to the Supreme Court, a party comes to the Supreme Court for some kind of emergency intervention. 
And the Alabama case is a great example. Right after the district court ruled in the Alabama case, Alabama goes to the Supreme Court and says, hey, we're going to be back in a year, right, to tell you that the district court was wrong on the merits. But while that's happening, we would like you to suspend the district court. We would like you to put that ruling on hold so that we can keep using our maps. That is emblematic of what we've seen more and more of from the court over the last really six years. And so the book really has two goals. The first is to put all of this into historical context for folks who are not necessarily lawyers or Supreme Court watchers. I think part of the problem, Matt, with the shadow docket is that a lot of the stuff is technical and obscure. And I really want to make it unobscure and accessible to folks who are interested, but maybe don't have law degrees. So part one is just the, the educational part of the book. Like, here's how the Supreme Court actually works. Here's what the shadow docket is. And then part two is, here's where in the last six years, the conservative justices have abused the heck out of it um, and have used it to a degree we've never seen before, in ways we've never seen before, in a, a series of decisions that aren't explained, that defy any like coherent, neutral legal justification, and that really give the appearance that the justices are playing political favorites by just voting for or against emergency relief. Matt, in cases like the Alabama case, where when the issue got back to the court on the merits, they actually sided with the challengers. The sort of the court keeps doing things that make the book look better. I'll just say, I, I'll put it that way. I, and can I just, if I'm hearing right and understanding right, and just to keep going on the Alabama example, because we've now fleshed it out a little yeah. bit, what you're basically saying is that the conservative majority on the Supreme Court is using the shadow docket to essentially say, hey, like it, it would be like I'm in the middle of assaulting someone on the street in Alabama and I'm actively pummeling them in the face and the police call up the Supreme Court and they say, we'd like to stop this. We want to arrest Matt Robeson. And the Supreme Court says, you know what? We're going to rule on that next year. But in the meantime, Matt is allowed to keep beating on someone and continue the assault until we rule. And then a year later, they're like, oh yeah, he's guilty. He's way guilty. Es essentially, they are allowing, and retroactively, th this ruling last week essentially says, oh, yeah, we allowed you to continue committing a crime here. And they get to do this with no transparency, no kind of public understanding, and it's all happening under our noses. Yeah. And part of the idea of the book is to bring it out in front of our noses. It really started in 2017 with a series of rulings that I think folks didn't really pay attention to about Trump immigration policies, where you'd have this pattern repeating where a lower court would block a Trump immigration policy. The Trump administration would go to the Supreme Court and say, hey, we'll be back in a couple of years. But in the interim, we'd like to keep carrying out this policy. And the Supreme Court would say, yes, and this happened. This is how Trump built part of the border wall. It's how Trump was able to carry out a couple of pretty controversial asylum policies. The ban on military service by transgender service members had the say. All of this, Matt, this was the pattern. And the problem is not in the abstract that the Supreme Court intervened. We could conjure up justifications for why those interventions might have been appropriate. The problem is that the second the partisan valence flips, the second it's the Biden administration who's now finding its immigration policies blocked by lower courts, and it goes to the Supreme Court with the same arguments for why it should get emergency relief, the court says no. Um, and the court says no, Matt, even in a case like the case from last term about remain in Mexico, where on the merits, Biden wins. And the problem is that once you put this behavior into context, it looks really bad, not because there are no explanations, that's problematic, but because the absence of explanations deprives us of any coherent, defensible justification for why it looks like the court is intervening to protect Republican presidents in red states, but not Democratic presidents in blue states. So, look, the issue of the shadow document seems... It, it obviously resonates enormously in the wake of all the recent revelations. We've got Clarence Thomas, Harlan Crow, financial conflicts, Leonard Leo, Federalist Society, funneling huge amounts of money to select and confirm justices, the behind the scenes political action about justices, and all the dark money that's used to influence decision making. Is this new? Did it 
just start when Trump came in and got his appointments? Is it part of a continuum of issues where the court is less accountable, less transparent, exercising power in both subtle and clearly political ways? And is the only answer, wait till the judges die and and appoint better non-political judges who aren't going to abuse the court's power? How worried, how should I be awake? Should I lie awake at night worrying about this? Not yet, but I will say, so is this new? It depends, Paul, on exactly what this is. And this is part of why I wrote the book, right? So if this is the ability of the Supreme Court to intervene very early in a case, no, that's not new. The court has always had that power. The problem then, as the book documents, there were two profound shifts in how the court intervenes. The first starts in the early 1980s and is a direct response to the reinstitution of the death penalty and to the rise of 11th hour emergency applications in death cases, where a stay is the only way to block an execution while a prisoner brings a challenge to their conviction or sentence or the method of execution. And there are all these procedural moves that the court makes in the 1980s that we could debate the wisdom of, but they stay confined to the death penalty. You ask anyone who clerked on the Supreme Court in the 80s or 90s or 2000s what they remember about the shadow docket, they'd say, oh, the death docket. What's new, Paul, is that starting in the mid-2010s, those procedural shifts, full court resolution, no opinion, no argument, no explanation, start seeping into cases with nationwide or statewide policy impacts. Mm from Obama's clean power plan to Trump immigration policies to COVID mitigation measures to Texas's six-week abortion ban to, as we saw in Alabama, redistricting, where now these kinds of unexplained interventions are showing up in all kinds of contexts that, Paul, we might not think of traditionally as emergencies. Is the only thing to do to wait for the justice to die? No. I think we've already seen at least some of the justices moderate their behavior in response to public criticisms. I think Justice Barrett and Justice Kavanaugh have both been less aggressive in the last six to 12 months in voting for emergency relief than they had been before that. Uh, But I think there's a broader problem here, and the book really tries to get into this, which is it's not just about the court granting emergency relief whenever it wants. It's about the court not being remotely constrained by Congress. And this this is a story that I think we don't tell enough when we talk about the current Supreme Court. What makes the current court unique compared to all of its predecessors is not that there's a conservative majority. There have been conservative majorities on the court in the past. It's not that they're handing down decisions that we find morally abominable. The court has handed down plenty of morally abominable decisions. That was Dred Scott, right? Plessy. The problem is that this court, to a degree unlike any of its predecessors, is not remotely beholden to Congress. And indeed, it has the view that it can't be remotely beholden to Congress, as typified by Chief Justice Roberts writing to Senator Durbin, who invited him to come testify, and saying, oh, me testifying would raise separation of powers concerns and risk infringing judicial independence. No, it wouldn't. Justices have testified going back to time immemorial, usually in support of reforms they have pushed for. And so if we tell a full history of the Supreme Court, and the book tries to do that. We see a Congress telling the Supreme Court when it can meet, telling the Supreme Court where it can meet. Until 1935, the court sat in the Capitol, telling the Supreme Court in 1964, hey, we're mad at you. And so you see this really nice pay raise that we're giving to every other federal judge. We're not giving it to you. One very famous 1868 case about reconstruction. Hey, Congress says, we don't want you decided in this case. So we're just going to take away your jurisdiction. And the Supreme Court says, okay, there is a back and forth historically that has really fallen by the wayside in the last 35 years. And to me, the way that we get this back, the way that we reform, Paul, things like the shadow docket or things like the ethic transgressions, however serious we might think they are, is not any one magic bullet. It's not changing who's on the court. It's reestablishing the inner branch dynamic that I think had a lot to do for the first 200 years 
with keeping the court in its lane. You know, really, Paul, it reminds me of when you were first elected to Congress with that historic class of 2006, you all ran around wearing Article One pins. Right. And people were wondering, what the Correct. hell are you doing? Yep. And it was, at the time, a reassertion of there's yes. a reason it's the first article in the Constitution, baby. And it's because it is supposed to be preeminent and it is the level of our government that is closest to the authority of the people. And at the time, you were aiming it at Article Two, the executive Correct. branch, but there is every bit it's Steve, both. Yeah, you were laying out a, just a brilliant case for why. And by the way, I would just say for anyone who wants to pick up on the other side of the coin that you're laying out here, go back to our interview from a few weeks ago with Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. And he laid out much the same kind of menu of options that Congress should have at its disposal and that he is trying to pursue. On this note, I know, Steve, that you are so in demand these days because, you know, there's a few things going on. We really should wrap up, but I want to urge people, we're entering summer reading season. Check out the Shadow Docket. It is, yes, hold it up for all to see. It is both a Jason <laughs> Bourne international CIA thriller and a fascinating <laughs> look at the inside of our Supreme Court and all of these problems and hopefully some solutions. And also people should check out the outstanding National Security Law Podcast, and they can also find your work on CNN. Uh, Steve Vladek, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Steve. Thank you guys for having me. This is great.